We would like to say a big thank you to our supporters, whose names are on screen now, and a link to help fund our channel will be pinned in the comments. All money goes to the writer of the channel, known as Disturbance Brother. From 1946 until 1948, American doctors carried out a number of human experiments in Guatemala. They targeted conscripted soldiers, the mentally ill, and even orphans, all of whom were exploited without their consent. Many were deliberately infected with syphilis, gonorrhea, and chancroid. The goal of the study was to observe whether penicillin had a use in preventing these transmissions of STIs, as well as to discover any other potential treatments. At least 1,300 people were infected, and at least 83 people are known to have died during the study, but many more may have been unknowingly infected, including the children of those affected. In today's video, we will look into the Guatemala study, its link to the Tuskegee experiment, and the consequences for those involved. It is perhaps helpful to start with the situation with respect to penicillin in the 1940s. It is well understood to treat all manner of diseases, including syphilis. Nevertheless, more preventative methods were sought in large part due to the many American soldiers being infected with venereal diseases. An estimated 350,000 people were infected, costing tens of millions of dollars each year in sick men. Dr. John Charles Cutler was part of the research team looking into ways to prevent gonorrhea. At the Terre Haute prison in Indiana, 240 prisoners were consensually enrolled in a study and infected with gonorrhea. The goal was to work out ways to prevent the transmission of the disease, though it proved to be difficult to introduce gonorrhea into the subjects, and so little information was gathered. It did, however, show the importance placed on such research, how it was deemed permissible to infect subjects with a disease so long as it furthered the military's needs. Nevertheless, the methods employed at the prison would be carried over by Cutler into a new study into syphilis. Shortly after penicillin became widespread, the United States Public Health Service wanted to know whether the drug could not only cure but also prevent syphilis. But, subjects were needed for experiments into such matters. Cutler and other doctors looked to Guatemala for subjects for the experiments. The country's National Penitentiary, an army barracks, and the National Mental Health Hospital were chosen for the venues of the studies. It is thought that anywhere between 1,500 and 5,500 people were involved in the study. Access to these people was obtained through bribing and bartering with those in positions of power. Even then, the doctors never fully explained what they were going to do. As can be seen in the botched Terre Haute prison experiment, it is difficult to medically induce such diseases. So instead, the researchers used sex workers who already had syphilis to infect the men. Guatemala was in part selected to host the experiments, as prostitution was legal. Whilst the initial plan was for the study to use the prisoners as test subjects, there were some problems. Transmission of syphilis proved to be ineffective for Cutler's study. What's more, the prisoners proved to be difficult to control and deal with. Instead, Cutler got in contact with the director of the National Insane Asylum, Carlos Salvador, who offered access to his patients as subjects. The bulk of those who contracted syphilis would be psychiatric patients. Following their sexual visits, the doctor carried out direct inoculations made from syphilis bacteria poured onto the men's faces, forearms, or penises to help ensure infections. Such visits to the sex workers who had syphilis was paid for by the study. If such methods did not work, the doctors would go to extremes to induce infections, including injecting the disease into the spines of the subjects. From the writings and comments of those involved in the study, it's clear they knew full well that the study was highly unethical. The Surgeon General, Thomas Perrin, stated, You know, we couldn't do such an experiment in this country. Cutler was very much under the impression that he had a limited time to prove his study was effective, which led him to be willing to attempt harmful additional methods of infecting the unwilling subjects. Most of these artificial infections were done without any regard to the patient's well-being. They were also not done in a sterile setting and seemingly done in the most disturbing of ways. 
One example can be found in the case of a psychiatric patient by the name of Berta. In February of 1948, Berta was injected in her left arm with syphilis. She would develop red bumps around the injection sites, all whilst suffering from scabies. Berta was not treated for syphilis until three months after her injection. Soon after, on the 23rd of August, Dr. Cutler wrote that Berta appeared as if she was going to die, but he didn't specify why. That same day, he put gonorrheal pus from another male subject in both of Berta's eyes, as well as in her urethra and rectum. He also reinfected her with syphilis. Several days later, Berta's eyes were filled with pus from the gonorrhea, and she was bleeding from her urethra. Three days later, on the 27th of August, Berta passed away. In order to obtain a controlled sample for comparison, the researchers obtained healthy samples from a children's orphanage. Whilst not as grotesque as the treatment of the medical subjects, it yet again highlights the researchers' approach to extracting what they require from the people of Guatemala, and especially of those in a vulnerable situation. Of the approximately 1,300 people known to have been subject to the experiments, less than 700 are known to have received some form of treatment. Usually, this was in the form of penicillin, but as seen in the tragic example of Berta, not every subject was given treatment, either at all or an adequate dose. It is known that 83 of the subjects died during the course of the study. What is less clear is the fate of those that went on to infect others, unaware that they had contracted syphilis. The researchers would often call the disease they were researching bad blood, a catch-all term for all manner of illnesses. Whilst the study officially ended in 1948, a number of the researchers remained to continue to take samples. Dr. Carlos Salvador continued to obtain lumbar puncture samples and sent these to the American research team. As for Dr. John Cutler, he continued his work in studying venereal diseases. In 1949, he moved on to study in India as part of the World Health Organization program. By 1958, he had reached the rank of Assistant Surgeon General. He oversaw much of the polio vaccine rollout in the 1960s, as well as helping arrange funds for better access to reproductive healthcare in West Africa. But also in the 1960s, Cutler joined onto the infamous Tuskegee experiment. We do have a video on this subject, but for the purposes of this video, we will briefly explain what it was. The Tuskegee experiment was a 40-year-long study into the effects of syphilis on African-American men, fueled by racist beliefs and hiding the subject's diagnosis. To this day, there persists a rumour that the participants were deliberately infected with syphilis during the experiment through injections. It was not the case that the subjects of the Tuskegee experiment were infected by the researchers, though it is not hard to see where such a myth could come from when the likes of Cutler were involved. Despite being an unnecessary, scientifically flawed and inhumane study, Cutler would later in life defend the Tuskegee study. When speaking about the study in a 1993 documentary, he said, it was important that they were supposedly untreated, and it would be undesirable to go ahead and use large amounts of penicillin to treat the disease, because you'd interfere with the study. It is thanks to the work of Professor Susan mokotov Reverby that much of what we know about the Guatemala study came to light. When she was researching the Tuskegee study in 2005, she uncovered a collection of Cutler's papers which indicated that he had deliberately infected people with syphilis. It soon led Reverby to realise that these papers related not to Tuskegee, but to Guatemala. In October of 2010, the Obama government formally apologised for the study. A commission was set up which concluded that the researchers breached not only the standards of today, but also of the time. It is important to note that only a few years prior had the world learned of the horrors of the Nazi human experiments, with many of those responsible brought to trial. In fact, the study was being carried out whilst the Nuremberg trials were well underway. Following the apology, a number of Guatemalans that were affected launched a civil claim. This was ultimately dismissed, with the courts holding that the United States government could not be held liable for the actions done outside of the United States. 
The Guatemala study provides a disturbing example of how certain classes or types of people were so often exploited for medical advancement. Those conducting the study were well aware of the immorality of their actions, and that such a study could not be done in the United States. As is a common theme in these types of videos, those affected were people with mental or psychiatric disabilities, seen as little more than test subjects. All of this done without the ever so important informed consent. But with the Guatemala study, there is the added horror of the doctors from the world superpower exploiting a developing nation in such a disturbing fashion. It is only thanks to Professor Reverby that such evidence was uncovered and shows just how our understanding of history is only ever expanded by re-examining and looking further into matters. Links will be pinned in the comments for those who wish to read further.